Greetings and salutations. This is the Art House Movie Video Cast. I'm the Movie Dude Eric. Along with me are John a Lobster, Janie Zarama. And this episode, we're going to be talking about Jurassic World. You know, that little tiny movie that you probably never heard about that all of a sudden just made a whopping amount of money. Yeah, we're going to talk about that movie, maybe a little about the money, maybe the future of the franchise. But I have to admit, I was not expecting what I, was, uh, what I got from the movie and from the response that that movie got. Now, first off, I need to ask, who saw the original Jurassic Park in theaters? I did. I was nine. <laughs> I was nine years old. I was um, 12. I actually had to lie to get in to see Jurassic Park by myself because they were not allowing anyone under the age of 13 to go by themselves without a, a parent. And I lied my way into that theater uh, to see it. Actually, that I, I find that interesting that you were 12 and you were 9. I was 23. <laughs> we got, you know, we got I, some different perspectives at the time. That's good, though. Uh, yes. I remember that. Uh, I was so excited for the movie. Um, and that was the first like adult book that I read. I read Crichton's novel um, before, like cover to cover, probably twice or three times before the the movie even came out. I was that excited for it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to make some references to why this franchise is significant for me. But, it, I mean, it's my Star Wars. I mean, the, the original movie. Not, maybe not in terms of, like, the way that, that like, um, Star Wars was, like, a benchmark for your movie-going experience of, like, to that generation. That was my experience with, with Jurassic Park and just, like, what was possible to do with movies. Well, it and, was a benchmark at the time. Yeah. yeah. Regardless of generation, it was an absolute just uh, benchmark. That was the first time we actually saw what CGI could do. That's true. Uh, all I remember was is that the first time I saw a trailer for it, uh, you know, I, I waited so long. This was the movie all summer long that I was the most excited about. In fact, I uh, I convinced. Uh, my parents to uh, cut a vacation short uh, so that I could go see this movie. That was how much I was invested. I read the book. I was, you know, looking at the toys. I, right. oh, yeah. uh, I, I think I even bought the soundtrack before I saw the movie. I uh, the toys. I remember. <laughs> now it's funny because I know schools get out sooner there because I was I was still in school and it was like the maybe like the last week of school for like the year and like I finally got to go see it oh, good, good times Jeannie you were <laughs> I mean I, I, I was okay, in that. college yeah all I know is that you know and, and especially now the, the, the a lot of the, the critics that, that I've been kind of paying attention to they were fanboys at you know that are around our age lobster who sure came into this at a young age and have grown up with this movie. And I have to admit, some of their responses were very different from uh, other people's responses. And, uh, in fact, I'm writing an article on it that will be on the Gun and Geek website uh, possibly by tomorrow, and I would strongly advise uh, checking it out if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, well, I'm... I mean, before we talk about this movie, let's talk about the franchise... The Lost World, Jurassic Park Three. I mean, were did those uh, live up to the original in your minds? At the time that I saw them, no. Yeah. No, absolutely not. I, I would I, say that the, the Lost World specifically has gone a little. Bit, I've been a little bit more fonder to that movie. Yeah. Uh, as uh, time has gone by, Jurassic Park Three. I I, I kind of like it a little bit. I, I'm not. So grown. I, I I love the fact that we finally get pterodactyls, and I love the pterodactyl scenes uh, in uh, Jurassic Park three. But for me, the the sequels just miss something, and and I realized that watching this movie, what it was that was missing. We'll talk about that uh, when we talk I, I about. I feel the like movie. between the the sequels, there's a good movie if you can smush them together and like. I mean, if you kept Grant and Ian Malcolm, like, 
it's like one without the other. I'm like, you need, you got to have both of them with those. And and there's characters in, like, I love Sarah Harding's character, uh, Julianne Moore, yeah. in the second one, and her character from the book. Um, and, again, like, there's aspects of the, the the way that the the action is put together in, in the third movie wh- where they you really saw them start to like be like okay this is what we can do with the effects and um but okay yeah let's let's talk about Jurassic World okay so i uh i saw this twice on uh, opening night even actually not even opening night the uh previews uh you know the the Thursday night showings that they had before Friday I actually got to see it twice um, due to uh, a, uh, a malfunction that uh, allowed us to get free passes and to get a second chance at it. Nice. But uh, I, I have to admit that I'm, g- I'm kind of glad that I saw it uh, two times around. It allowed me to really contemplate this movie and think about a lot of the stuff that it was doing, some of it that they did right, some of it that they kind of missed the point on, but especially all of the Easter eggs and this thing is peppered yeah. with Jurassic Park love. This thing loves Jurassic Park as much as his fans, and it shows for almost from the first scene to the last. But uh, what, Eugene? Um, I saw it on Thursday as well. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, the people I went with liked it a lot more than I did. Um, <laughs> It's it's definitely a flawed blockbuster, but most blockbusters are flawed. Um, overall, I'd say I had fun, but I definitely had issues with it. What about you, uh, Lobster? I had to wait till Sunday. I had a pretty busy weekend that weekend, and I knew that you know I wouldn't get to see it until probably the towards the the close of the weekend, and. So I kind of had the whole weekend to build it up in my mind and think about what I was going to see and what I wanted to see. And I know it, like, looking at some of the reviews beforehand, I was kind of like, oh, I was a little disappointed seeing what some of the critics were saying about the film. And they were saying, you know, it really doesn't live up to the original. And, And here are some problems and then I went to see it, and I went by myself, and it was the, the 10 a.m. showing on Sunday. So, so I was literally, like, sitting in the pew at the Church of John Hammond there uh, in the theater. Yeah. And I absolutely loved it. And Wait, it, did it, you see it in 3D out of, out of curiosity? No, I saw I standard 2D. Um, that's my go-to. I don't um, – unless uh, – uh, I won't get into my thoughts on 3D, but unless it's like like an avatar that's like this is the 3D, that's the true way to see it. I don't I don't t- tend to go with those. Um, I did see Jurassic Park when they released it in 3D a yeah. couple of years ago. But, um, you know, maybe if I get to, a chance to go see it again, I'll try the 3D. But anyway. I, the, would, I would strongly recommend it. it. It really does work very well in this movie. I, I can imagine because just the depth of seeing the realized vision of what a theme park with dinosaurs would be, um, and without you know going further in the plot than that, but just the the opening of the film and and setting up that world, and that's really I. At, at first, when they changed the title, I was a little skeptical, like, oh, Jurassic World. Like, this must be in Orlando, right? Because it's, uh, <laughs> that's what we have to call yeah. the theme parks there. Um, I think it was intentional that they decided to do that. And yeah. Especially after you see the park. Yeah, this is definitely, it feels like a theme park. Right. And not only, like, not only the park, but, okay, so we've, we've skipped forward in time and... We're not on Site B anymore. We're and, back at Isla Nublar. Right. And and the world part, there's so much world building that goes on. And that's part of what I loved about the original was just building the world in, in, in which something like this is possible was something that I really enjoyed about the sequel, or Jurassic World. Yeah. But uh, what did you think about it, Jeannie? Uh, did you kind of gasp in awe as we saw the park as it was fully realized? Gasp in awe? No. <laughs> um, I wouldn't go that far. I did see it in IMAX. I saw it in the IMAX. Um, but 
I thought it was I thought it was done really well. They obviously um, had some input from the Universal right uh, the Universal theme park people because that is you're right. It, it looks exactly like what a theme park would look like with the center, or, you know, the big center. Yeah. Building and all the outlying buildings and and moving out and everything it it looked like a theme park yeah. and it, and and at the same time I you know I have to uh, I listened to uh, comedy film nerds talking about it earlier this week and mm -hmm. I have to agree with them I want to know why our theme parks don't have that hollow stuff because that stuff's available now <laughs> all that stuff why don't they have that <laughs> that would I, be awesome they spared no expense <laughs> no. Oh, yes. I, I, I gotta agree with Maslani on that. Uh, Maslani, I, I, I love uh, the fact that they went all out with this yeah. theme park. I, now, last year I did actually go to the Universal Studios theme park in Florida, and I did actually go to the Jurassic Park L, uh, area, and that was really awesome. And part of me was kind of jealous that I couldn't go this year because you know that they're throwing out all kinds of Jurassic yeah. World uh, attire, oh, yeah. and they're really pulling that out because. That would have been just just awesome to be to be honest. And yes, this feels just like uh, the Universal Studios uh, theme park. I, you know, the, I I love the fact. I know that a lot of people didn't enjoy kind of getting a tour of the park and mm -hmm. getting to see all the different areas. I Me, mean, I was jonesing on all that. I yeah. loved you know seeing them raft down the river, you know, the lazy river. And uh, you know, doing the gyroscopes uh, with with the dinosaurs, uh, because the the idea of this movie is that we finally have right. the park. We did the it, park you crazy, crazy son of a bitch! You did it. You know, that's <laughs> like the whole thing. Yes, it's like we we finally we finally have that. And thank God for corporate sponsorship. Am I right, you guys? Like, oh my if God, it wasn't for Samsung and Verizon and all of that. Like, I mean. The only movie I've seen it more blatant than that was Wayne's World when they went through that whole montage. Sponsored <laughs> by Bud Light. I, I mean, but like to be completely honest, like that to me grounded it more in reality than because it looked like a theme park. Right. Exactly. Like I've like, everywhere in I've, a theme park. Been you know, and there's Margaritaville and and Starbucks. And, I still want a Winston Steakhouse. Just saying, oh, I want yeah, a Winston did, State yeah. House. That, um, I, but I mean, like again, it's that it it totally grounds it in the reality of it and the and the business of it and the and, and really the the premise of the movie, which is setting up a way to just make more money. I mean, just back up that dump truck full of cash so we can we can get some more uh, sell some more tickets here. And 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 that's the that's basically the the setup for the film. In a way, I feel like, especially with all the corporate sponsorship and the, the blatant uh, kind of expanse, expansion to the original idea of, the, of uh, Jurassic Park, that in a way, this film is kind of making fun of itself a little yes. bit in that same kind of Twenty One Jump Street thing. Like, yeah, we know what we're here for. And first off, you're going to get what you what you ask for, which right. is a lot more than I can say about Godzilla that thought that it was a little bit better than it was. You know, you're going to get dinos fighting dinos. You're going to get, you know, people getting chewed on. You're mm -hmm. going to get everything that you're asking for with a movie that has the moniker Jurassic Park. Now, the, the only problem with that is that Spielberg was so good in that first movie of making it more than it being just about dinosaurs that no matter what sequel was going to come out and that was one of the things that I kind of had to accept with The Lost World specifically that you weren't going to it wasn't going to satisfy because it wouldn't have that philosophical element yeah. that he clearly had with Jurassic Park and Jurassic World had that same problem uh, right from the beginning because and, and what was worse was that they were trying to emulate some of those same steps you know the kids uh, using the kids as kind of a proxy uh, having the multiple narratives branching out but kind of still coming to back together uh, you could easily say that uh, the Chris Pratt character Owen is a, a kind of combination of, of both Grant and Malcolm a, a little bit 
And, and with uh, with Muldoon's wardrobe. <laughs> yes, clever girl. Clever girl, not clever enough. <laughs> and I, I'm I'm going to say this about Claire. I I I have to give this to her. The fact that she practically has to do mo almost everything that Owen does and does it in heels the entire yeah. time. I and salute a, you. Yeah. I salute Not you. Not just heels, a pencil skirt. Do you know how hard <laughs> it is to run in a pencil skirt regardless of the shoes you're wearing? Because you can't, There, it by design yeah. limits your leg movement. Yeah. I just remember what Ginger Rogers said uh, when they right, said, how exactly. is it to uh, dance with Fred Astaire? And it's like, I do everything Fred does except I do it in heels backwards. Back, backwards and then high heels. Well, and I, um, Bryce, Bryce Howard, right? That's Bryce her name? Dallas yeah, Howard, song. not Jessica Chastain <laughs> as the, uh, the song. I love that. Uh, mixing her up. Um, she was on the... The, the the show that replaced Craig Ferguson late late James Corden anyway when she was on there she was talking about how she trained for months to be yeah. able to uh, with ankle exercises and everything so she would be able to run because you need to uh, yeah. unstable high heels and unstable are synonymous <laughs> I, 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 although I will say that I think I would have cheered if at some point she just took off the heels and strapped on some, some Nikes. I mean, get a little extra product placement in there. I think I would have cheered just because you don't ever see that. The, the fact that, you know, it, uh, it got to a point where it's asking, is she still in heels? And then you find out, yes, yeah, she's still in heels. I, she's I, still I, I, I mean, I, I, I think I it was for that shot at the end with the T-Rex when she's running in front of the T-Rex, like it was, it was all set up. And I know she has said that it was a conscious choice that she made because if you're running through a jungle, it's better to run in like some sort of footwear. It doesn't yeah. really matter what it is rather yeah. than running barefoot when you can, you know, have anything happen. But I kind of really wanted like a dinosaur to come out and like <laughs> you see her kick and then it just has like the stone oh, in the yes. eye or something. Like <laughs> that just, would just be to be. Cool. Just to that be like, make... okay, there, yeah, there you go, there you go. But um, can I just say, like, when they cast Bryce Dallas Howard, um, I have loved her in in everything that she's done. I may not have loved every movie that she's been in, but she is an absolute goddess, and and everything that every role that she's done, she's breathed such life into it. And I think that that this is no different. And yeah. when you look at the characters of the film. It's so interesting that obviously Chris Pratt gets top billing and, and his star power is kind of credited with propelling this film to where it's where it's gone, but most of the conversation is about her character and the various interpretations of her character and sort of like the validity of, of different perspectives. But I mean I really have to say that this is this is her movie because it's her story arc that kind of propels the the film and for all of Chris Pratt's contribution it's kind of and again like the way it kind of mirrors the film is like she's kind of doing all the hard work and then he gets the credit just like when yeah. the boys show up and be like oh he's such a badass I um I I do I I I I have mixed feelings about the high heels and to be perfectly honest that wasn't even an issue for me um Looking back on it, I thought I think it would probably be a, a cool thing if they had done like *Romancing the Stone*, where they right. took the machete and cut the heels off. Um, yeah. But at the same time, the way that Bryce Dallas Howard saw her character, and this is a conscious choice on her play, on the uh, on her as an artist, she, the way she saw that character was those those heels were her armor. Mm -hmm. That's how she deals with the world so if things are going to hell she's not going to give up her she, a she's not going to give up her heels and b when was she going to, to you know she didn't really get a chance there there yeah. you're right there could have been a, a product placement that could have had a, a Nike store or something <laughs> <laughs> or, or like, I mean, you know, a, a, in those parks, they do have those shoe stores. A pair of Crocs out of the gift shop or something, you know. <laughs> is that really? Is that really what you want? I mean, come on. Or, or, or like Timberland. Yeah. Um, so some hiking yeah. boots. You know, the, I mean, the, I mean, 
the yeah. thing about this, if you don't, I'm just going to say one last thing about the yeah. heels, and then we can move on. But after watching this movie, I actually started thinking about all those other action movies where there was so much running and jumping by guys, and I thought. You know, wouldn't it be interesting if they were in heels yeah. the entire time? Like Die Hard. You know, instead of him being barefoot, he was in heels running around, you know, dealing with terrorists and stuff like that. Uh, you know, the the uh, the running man. You know, if Schwarzenegger in pumps, uh, right there, that, that right there would have gotten people into the seats, I think. <laughs> I mean, I just think, and just think about how crazy awesome that would be to see, you know, because you know the, how hard it is to, to walk in heels. Anyone who's ever even put their foot in heels know just how difficult it is to, to do any kind of maneuvering with sure. them. And this movie really does give you a lot to appreciate what that Bryce Dallas Howard is doing. But I will say that when it comes to her, she, her character's gotten most of the scrutiny out of yeah. this movie. Right. I mean, that's, that's what I mean in, in terms of, like, the, the conversations that have sprung up around the film, a lot of it has been about her character and, and the various kind of like ways that you can, I'm going to say you can put your own agenda kind of on her character because well, I, I think that her character holds up fine on her own. But Well, yes and no. The, um, I, I honestly believe that, uh, and, and for, for me, part of the reason she gets, uh, the main reason she gets most of the scrutiny um, is twofold. First, it, it's almost like they went and gathered every single modern woman trope that they've used in the past 30 years and put it all in one character. First. Secondly, you take that character and compare her to Laura Dern in the first movie, mm -hmm. and she's sorely lacking. But better than Taylor Leone, let's be honest there. Better than Taylioni. Well, is, yeah. Well, even and even compared to Julianne Moore. Right. Julianne I like Sarah Hardy. Solid, solid uh, character um, in a bad movie, but yeah. <laughs> but you compare that to to um, she in the end, you know, she has. Well, you know what? We'll, we'll get to. In, but that's why that we'll get into that later. But um, that's why the scrutiny is. You compare her to Laura Dern. And it's not even a contest. I don't know. It's like, and I know that maybe I'm putting Jurassic Park on such a high pedestal, but Laura Dern is doing things in that movie that you know were groundbreaking, specifically for for women characters. I mean, yeah. the fact that she was confident, competent, that she wouldn't take crap from anybody, but at the same time, she wasn't a, a male replacement. She no. She had her own storyline. She had her own arc. She was a legitimate expert in what she was, and she was presented that way. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, the the scene where she's about to go turn back on the power or whatever, and, and John Hammond's like, you know, it really should be me going out because you're a – and I'm a – I didn't like, even need well, that we'll, scene. We can, we'll discuss, we'll discuss uh, gender roles in survival situations right. later. <laughs> I love that line, but it was so not needed because we already knew that. Yeah, it was like, you already, you already was... kind of had it down. And I, I, I will say for Claire Deering in, in Jurassic World, I mean, her character is, is like the character who kind of like is, is put in charge of everything, gets blamed for everything when it goes wrong. Nobody listens to her. And, she, you know, she's the one who's – has to like try to protect her nephews. Has to try to protect the the park, and and it's it's really and she has to get her man. Really a thankless, really kind of thankless role for yeah. her for her character. So I mean, I mean, I again, I think that it, it's kind of like I I won't say that that really any of the characters in this film are as strong as the 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 characters that yeah. are built. In, in the original Jurassic Park. I think, for what it's worth, Jurassic World spends much more of its efforts on the world building and the action than the, the actual character development. But I think her character gets the most development of any. And, um, I mean, did anybody really feel the uh, the relationship between the two kids 
um, no. going going that far. No. Um, and can any, I, can I, ask, I have a quick a question for the yeah. the both of you. Yeah. Um, I think the the one of the main questions, Claire aside, one my main question I'm left with is, who is she answering to? Because the owner of the park clearly didn't care. Well, I think that he's our, our replace. Uh, that she's the replacement for Maslani for the big decisions. That he's going off and dreaming up the next big right. thing or doing, you know, kind of. Uh, you know, he's the dreamer, and she's kind of the pragmatist the, that's the there to make sure day, that yeah. Yeah, uh, but, make sure that the the trains run on time. Literally, in this sense. Yeah, I yeah, mean, and and I see that, but. I mean, he's supposed to be a replacement for Hammond, but he's also the corporate stooge that she's working for yeah. that's rushing her to kill, and I didn't, I didn't get that from him. I don't you know, think that I he was... The, I got the wide-eyed innocence and the wide-eyed childlike wonder, but I did not get the pressure on her from him, and, and that's not her fault. That's a, that's obviously a writing issue, yeah. but I just didn't, oh. it's just not there yeah. for me. There's the sense that she's kind of middle management, and yeah. then he's upper management. But I felt like there's a piece missing there, too. And the same thing with uh, Vincent D'Onofrio's character. There's clearly <laughs> someone that he's getting orders from that's not yeah. um, Masrani yeah. that, that kind of is, is driving this. So I'm <laughs> thinking there's like a layer in there in InGen where Mas Masrani just went and got himself killed, and Hoskins is dead, and... Deering is presumably out, Claire is presumably out of a job because the park is, you know, overrun with T-Rexes now. Um, so in terms of, I don't even know where a sequel is going to go, but that we're probably going to see that kind of rear its ugly head. There's probably a board of, uh, you know, chairman in there somewhere that, that's got their own kind of plans. Yeah. I, I kind of take it that Masrani, uh, again, he was the dreamer, he's the innovator, he's the Tony Stark that could dream up whatever he wanted. I think they're playing a, 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 a Tony Stark Pepper Potts relationship between Masrani and Claire. Oh, he um, <laughs> no, no, I mean, you know, I'm talking about on, on, on a, uh, kind of yeah. the, the business side, not right. uh, like personal he's, side. He comes up with all these great ideas and, and she's kind of left like with yeah. the day-to-day, -day, right? Which, again, is, is kind of tropey territory. But um, what it... Okay, so let's talk about Mizrani, Simon Mizrani, uh, who he says... Erfan Khan, baby! I love this guy! He uh, says uh, that, that John Hammond picked him to take over. So that we know that, that John, Han John Hammond died somewhere between... Because um, he shows up in The Lost World, but I don't think he's around for Jurassic Park 3. He and wasn't in Jurassic Park. So he he's passed on, and and at some point presumably they've uh, gone back to Site A and rounded up all the stray dinos, including the the T Rex Rexy, um, and really kind of like turned it around. I think that what's okay. I mean, I can actually do like a, a fifteen minute history from what I right, right. saw about uh, how, how they've uh, and they did a really good job of establishing how the park got built. Right. I, I, I love how they use the maps. I love how you get little snippets of dialogue here and there that give you that fill in uh, the information. I love that we go back to the original compound. Right. Oh and, my god. Oh my little nine-year-old heart <laughs> was beating yeah. out of my chest right there when the they, Jeep. oh, the old Jeep and, and all mm -hmm. of that. With 22-year-old gas that still works. Hey, it, it can hold up. Um, the, uh, okay, so, and then on the map you see, like, the north part of the island is, like, this restricted area. And yes. you find out later in the movie that that's where all the crap went down uh, in the first movie. That, that that's kind of like the ruins of the old. They didn't, like, build on the, the old structure. They, they right. built a different part of the island. Right. I think Eric's breaking up a little bit. Did I lose Jeannie? No, I'm here. Okay, yeah, right. okay. Uh, my, okay. Yeah. Okay, Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, again, all, all of that stuff, I also love the fact that you have other little snippets uh, that give you more information. Uh, uh, I don't know if y'all noticed this, but um, 
uh, we see Ian Malcolm's book like like three or four times, including one of the uh, people in the control panel uh, having a copy of it. If I'm not correct, one person uh, in that control panel was also kind of indicate or had uh, been spouting off uh, stuff that Ian Malcolm had mentioned in, I think, mm -hmm. The Lost World. Um, so I, I get the feeling like Malcolm was maybe a consultant uh, when it comes to uh, Jurassic World specifically. Um, again, uh, there's a lot of areas where uh, we could get a whole lot more information. And, of course, seeing B.D. Wong come back, uh, especially if you've read the book and know just how important uh, Wu is to mm -hmm. uh, this entire operation. It, it was awesome to kind of see him. And I love the fact that because in the movie they didn't really show just how menacing this guy was. Yeah. That his, black, Wong, his black turtleneck and, <laughs> and his, and his kind of like his, bitchy attitude. It's perfect. His chai tea. Well, clearly yes. he made it to the boat though. Uh, uh, on the yes, first, yes the he first. made it to the boat in the first one. And he got on the helicopter this time. I mean, he got he's, out. he's out there, and I, part of me is kind of happy because, again, if you've, know, if you've read the book, Wu is like, if Hammond was the crazy guy that was spending money on the dinosaurs, this is the Frankenstein that he yeah. uh, hired to. Yeah. He's definitely yeah. Dr. Frankenstein. And I, and I love kind of like, because again, this is something that people have criticized the film on, uh, because in 1993, we thought dinosaurs looked a certain way. And now we find out, you know, oh, they got feathers, and there's this, and there's that. And I like, love that part. And, and he's like, look, you're not, you'd never ask me to make dinosaurs the way that dinosaurs look. Yeah. You want me to make dinosaurs that people think that they want to see. Yes. And and so like the the answer of why like okay we, you know we call them velociraptors but they're about three feet taller than like any velociraptor that ever lived and yeah and and like they they don't have feathers they they look this way you know and and we can domesticate them enough or breed them in a certain way that you can use them in a petting zoo and have your little your little kiddos ride on them and go kayaking down the stream next to the stegosaurus. Or, Not the velociraptors, other dinosaurs. That would have been rather interesting. Right, but they don't want the velociraptors to be docile. They want them to be aggressive. They just want to be able to train them to. And that's you know, another. Uh, the, now that you mentioned the Stegosaurus, there is a uh, strong uh, indication at this point because they need more evidence and they haven't found it yet. But they think that the Stegos what we think of as the Stegosaurus, is essentially a mid form. Yes. It's it's a it's essentially a teenage form of another dinosaur. Right. I They're not the Triceratops. The Triceratops was the uh, mid form. Before it reaches its ultimate form and becomes yeah. you know, super dinosaur saiyan. Um, but but again, like it, just the way that this film approaches those kind of questions. To me, that was I I was willing to sacrifice a little bit of like the story development, yeah. the, the the character development, and stuff like that, just to like wrap my head around how we got from there to here why things look the way that they do. And I think that um, the writers, and again, this movie was written, there was a script that was written by two people, um, Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver, who, who wrote Rise of the Planet of the Apes and, and wrote an entire script. And then when Trevor well, wrote this got 10 the years picture, ago. Yeah, right? I mean, it, this has been in development for so long that um, just to kind of like, and I think it dealt very logically with why... Jurassic World exists the way that it, it does now, and and why these why we have the dinosaurs looking the way that they do. Yeah, I thought I honestly I that's probably my favorite part of the uh, of the show uh, of the movie was when that conversation with P.D. Wong and he's telling him, you know Miserati that you don't want cool, cooler. I think that's what it said in your memo, right? Cooler. <laughs> <laughs> you know, more bigger, scarier, more yeah. teeth. You know. But, and I think that might be my biggest problem with mm -hmm. them overall is they spent so much time on the world right. and so little time on characters. Mm -hmm. And 
when I go to when I read a book, when I go to a movie, when I watch a television show, I relate to the characters first, world second. If the 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 world being awesome is a bonus, mm. not an absolute necessity, as long as things make sense. And on, like honestly, for me, I mean, one this film again with with like the screenwriting and all of that it's not as quotable i don't think as the first one there there aren't as many you know one liners that i think are going to you know end up in enduring as much but that said i think for a franchise like this and we've seen this so much recently in terms of uh films rejuvenating long extinct franchises so to speak you know, um, Mad. Well, you want to talk about Mad Max: Rise of the Planet of the Apes, or hey, there's this movie coming out in December. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, it's called Star Wars. You know, yeah. um, but but it, but again, like to to restart a franchise, um, this movie does the legwork in setting up where it can go from here, and 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 kind of like rebuilding this world uh, quite literally on the on the ashes of. Of what's gone before, yeah. but and I think, and, and that's actually something that uh, occurred to me when we were talking about it a little bit earlier. Um, they're they're rethinking uh, the way movies are done at this oh, point. Oh, absolutely, partially yeah. because of the way television is happening right now, and I think that's part of the reason why the uh, what Lost World and Jurassic Park three didn't work because they weren't thinking long-term story right. they were just thinking story as it happens mm -hmm. instead of trying to and then trying to shove them into this puzzle that wasn't fitting whereas we're, we're coming to it to an era where more and more people are trying to think bigger world and how does it fit in you're thinking uh, three movies ahead you know yeah well, you gotta thank the Avengers, and you gotta thank Game of Thrones, and the, the current state of science fiction and fantasy, where it, it is all about the second and third mm -hmm. installments. Yeah, that the first is always they're kind of the the legwork, the background, the uh, getting everybody caught up and, and on the same page, so that when you go into the next one, everyone knows where uh, we're going. Do, uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes had the same issue where. Uh, because it was dealing with a, uh, a very uh, docile uh, franchise and was trying to invigorate it, they had to have the same kind of pacing, uh, you know. And I think that in a way that's making films a little bit more interesting, but at the same time, it, it makes it also very frustrating because you really just want a good yeah. movie. I mean... You know, yeah. Look at look at for example. I mean, I'm a big Spider-Man fan. I don't know if you can see the Spider-Man uh, stuff on Spider-Man stuff on the shelf behind me, but like didn't recognize it. Uh, but like the the last two Spider-Man films, both of them were billed as like the beginning. You know what I mean? Like yeah. oh, we're we're getting there. We're getting there, right? And we've got to set up this origin. Yada yada yada. We're getting there. And then, boom! It's it's over now, and it's like so. Then you get two movies into a, a franchise without ever really feeling like it started, yeah. and I think that's a trap that that these movies can fall in. But do you guys want to talk? Because I, I want to talk numbers. So I, I want to talk about the like Imperius Rex real quick. Oh, okay, yeah. Plot we haven't talked about the I Rex. Indominus. Um, Indominus Rex. Abomin mm. Abominable. Um, <laughs> It's got to roll I, off. It's got to roll off the tongue, the, right? I did like the reasoning behind the name. Yeah, that the was Verizon, a, wire, the Verizon Wireless presents the Indominus Rex. Yeah, I could totally see that happening. I, uh, and I, think, I love the, the slow reveal. I, I love the fact that that we get little mm -hmm. uh, snippets. I, I love how many of the new dinosaurs have that same thing. The uh, that uh, I want to keep calling it the whale shark. Uh, which, by the way, awesome. Uh, that that was great foreshadowing. I mean, oh, they, your Chekhov's gun, you mean? <laughs> your Chekhov's <laughs> dinosaur. Yeah. I love it because as soon as you see the water, you know what's coming. Yeah. They did such a good job. It's like anytime you see that water, oh, 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 yeah. But uh, 
No, but I love how with with, with the Indominus Rex that that uh, they give us the slow reveal. Yeah. Uh, although I wish that they would have you, especially considering that they weren't going to use this as a um, as a sequel bait, where we're going to have another one, or maybe there is. I mean, right. we know that there were three. Uh, she eat, ate a sibling. sibling. Yeah. So there might be another one. We don't know, but we hope. Uh, or at least I do, because this time I hope that they'll actually utilize everything about it, and right from the beginning we know exactly what it can do. Right. But I, especially considering how as much time as they spent on the psychology of dinosaurs, uh, which I wasn't expecting with this movie, I'll be honest. I wasn't expecting uh, kind of the... Animal the, psychology? The, yeah, like, the, oh, uh, Caesar, like all, uh, all it knows is that crane gives it food, like... Like oh so you you bred it in a test tube you raised it in captivity it's never been around anything else to to form like a positive bond or mm. yeah it's, you're basically raising a psychopath. I I love I mean I love all that but I wasn't expecting it but I mean if you're gonna set up a psychological element with this animal I would love to see it pay off although I have to admit the the whole uh, raptor uh, twist. I loved. I don't care if it came off as Dex Machina, but I love I, it. But I told you that was going to happen. I yeah, she did. You yes, asked she did. me for my prediction, and I said it's going to be the Alpha, and it's going to tell the other dinosaurs what to do. But I t- but uh, at the same time, you were also kind of meaning all dinosaurs and not just raptors. So uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, mos- uh, maybe it just didn't speak mosasaur. <laughs> that's all. That's you know, it didn't translate I, under the water. Then why would it kill I, everything I, else? I I think I I right. I agree with you. I they could have done so much more. I mean, if you'd found the, out, the it only needed a, a hug. Dinosaur, and they they set that up, and there's no payoff for that, and and that is a dis- that is disappointing. Well, I mean, again, if there's a second one, you know, maybe on that uh, black site uh, that uh, we didn't really get right. to go into, or if Engine got their hands on it, oh, well, that's, crap, that's that would I mean, be like, scary. Like, when Wu gets away with his little cooler full of stuff or whatever, unfortunately yes. not a Barbasol can, but, you know, same same principle. I like, wanted to see a Barbasol can. Even if it was just, a, you know, just a, a passing thing, like it was in, like, like in like the gift someone's... shop, you know. Yeah. Um, but, again, like, this this is something that can return. I know that that in in like uh, development of this story, they teased the idea of human dinosaur like hybrids, like more more humanoid looking dinosaur mutants. Um, they they teased like a tricera stegos, stegotops or something like that yeah. like, that you could see. But but the I, the concept of the Indominus Rex is is something where at first I was like what, and then I was like duh, it totally makes sense. Like Eventually, kids, whatever audiences, are going to get bored, just like we kind of get bored with these blockbuster movies coming out year after year. What's what's the next thing? We need more, more, bigger explosions, more excitement, whatever. And, then and that was the, really what the kids were meant to do, was it was supposed to get that point across. And yeah. they, it's just they didn't give enough time. And that older brother specifically yeah. was just not doing it. The, the younger brother was doing great. I, lo- I love this he's, actor. His name is Todd Sipkins. Yeah, and he's uh, in Iron Man 3. Yeah. I mean, the, the kid the, the kid just bounced with energy. And I could, uh, you know, I, I would have, I, I took him as the Tim, you know, the, the, the yeah. Tim from the original. And... I just his older brother though was just such a lump, and he was meant to be that way because he's supposed to be that oh who cares about dinosaurs kind of thing. But and, and the fact that they had done in Jurassic uh, Park three, the 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 brothers bonding and then like the like the divorce plot line, they did that I think in in the Lost World too because uh, the girl was like because they were divorced. Malcolm and, and Harding. So no, like, no, they, no. They were they, she she was uh, she went off on that trip without him right. knowing uh, because uh, they were having problems. But the, the divorce thing came from Jurassic Park. Tim and Lex's parents were getting divorced. Oh, That's why they went you're so to right. the compound. You're so right, and that was in the book. That never really got mentioned in the movie. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. It, that was in the movie, not the book. The book didn't have grandkids. The grandkids were uh, uh, was Spielberg because he wanted to have kids in his movie. No, Tim and Tim and Lex were in the book. 
it's been such a long since I've read it, but I, I know that that uh, Spielberg loves having kids in his yeah. movie because he in loves fact, getting that child uh, perspective. Crichton's, Crichton's first draft of the book was completely from the kid's perspective, and he decided to rewrite it to to be more more of an adult. And those kids were story. much more interesting than these two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, but again, like I, I feel like again they they kind of like recycled that plot element and then then didn't really quite pay it off. But we I mean there were some good scenes certainly the the, the hamster ball scene where it was uh, I was think that's so bad. You want one of those? <laughs> as long as it has Jimmy Fallon in it on the little screen, that's <laughs> that was fun. Uh, the whole theater laughed when they saw Jimmy Fallon on there. Well, well, they're, well, they're trying to up the Richard Kiley um, right, exactly. reference in the first yep. movie. Yep. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, th th that's the thing is that this movie was definitely, uh, and they were going so uh, above and beyond the original Jurassic Park in the look uh, that it felt again like it was really being com it was a commentary on sequels in itself. Uh, got bigger, badder, more teeth. Um, obviously, we have more dinosaur fights in this than we had in the original. Uh, we have more dinosaurs in this yeah. one than the original, uh, which for me was a good thing because I again, I, if we would have just had, if it was just a travel log of Jurassic World, I think I would have been yeah. happy. Uh, if it was nothing else, I would have, I, I would have just yeah. loved going through this park and uh, like they would have sold me. <laughs> And there, th there's kind of like the, the the thing of like, you know, oh, it'll work this time. The last time the dinosaurs ate everybody, but this time, which I, ge I guess like the, it's been in operation for mm -hmm. years now and things have gone pretty much okay. And I love the fact that like early on in the film, you kind of establish that, yeah, the dinosaurs do kind of get out every once in a while and they have like a special team it's that goes through. around that goes around and collects them, um, and then they get out and start ramming their, you know, the Pachyosaurs ram their heads into each other or whatever. You know what I was hoping to see you know, in Jurassic Park? Oh, that team? Yeah, it was all men. Was no, no, it wasn't. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I don't I was remember looking. there being a woman that team. It was not. I'm, but I'm, I'm, sure I'm not going to, I'm not, because I only saw it the once. I'm not gonna like stake my my life on it, but I, I'm pretty sure. Either. I only saw it the once, but, but I was they had, they had looking because by that point I was like, oh my god, really? <laughs> so I was specifically cool. looking. Can we at least have one? Well, what I was hoping for was that I was waiting for there to be a dinosaur rights activist uh, group. Or, Extinct or... animals have no rights. We've established that, and they did like they did answer that question. He was like, extinct animals have no rights. You know, they were, you know, they're clones, whatever. So, Tell Greenpeace that when it comes to them trying to save endangered species. I mean, uh, I would love to have the Greenpeace guy, like, parachute in there to be like, <laughs> free the dinosaurs and then just get that eaten. That would be a you great, know? that would be a great, uh, you, know, oh, you know, that we lost really another, we got, lost another activist, he got stepped on by a Brachiosaurus, <laughs> you know. Oh my god, that would have been awesome. Yes! <laughs> I'm but sorry, I, I mean, the thing is, is that th this movie is so full of ideas yeah. that I, I wish that they would go to, but again, it was two hours long as it was. If you had thrown every idea that you had in it, it would have been a three-hour movie. Right. I, I I just hope that from here on, okay. I, I don't know if we'll have another park, so to say. I think that third time's of it, you're not going to get it again. Well, I think uh, the, the world thing is, like, the big thing. One, uh, the Jurassic Park comic books in the 90s were, were pretty good after the movie. Uh, Topps Comics, I don't even know if they still you know publish, but they had a series of Jurassic Park comic books that kind of followed out. And what happens is the dinosaurs do get off the island, and one of the storylines I remember, which is oddly kind of mirrored here, is um, a couple velociraptors end up somehow in Colombia, and this drug lord captures them and basically trains them with, like, electric collars to, like, be his security guards. Oh, so it, wow. it's, it's, like, almost what, what the movie's doing. I'm sure it's, I'm sure they kind of, like, look, referenced that or looked at that. Honestly, but, I think that is what the sequel is really going to be about, yeah, is that yeah. these dinosaurs are going to get off the island, and it's going to cause havoc. 
and not, and not only that, but the technology. Um, Trevor Rao has said a couple times that he wants to see what happens when this goes open source, meaning that like yeah. you've got your 3D printer. Well, okay, print yourself a, a Velociraptor or something. Uh, I'm just thinking that, especially how they established that engine uh, is pretty much our big bad at this point. Uh, they they really did a good job of putting them forefront because they are thinking about those sequels and they need a villain uh, for those sequels and I think it's going to be Engine specifically that's going to play that role. And and you know what? It may not even be Engine because they're obviously going to be hit with some lawsuits. I'm assuming no, by, no. by people that were. Uh, attacked by Tyrannodons. Really? So, so maybe to, to make up some of that cash, they have to sell their, their rights, their technology off to the highest bidder, and then you end up with someone who really is sinister getting their hands on that technology. I like the idea of it being engine because it's easy, because especially for audiences, it's it's a, an enemy that they can get behind. Uh, a, a greedy corp a paramilitary uh, corporation uh, that has the ability that uh, is unscrupulous and hires really bad well, people. Talk about unscrupulous. Remember in the first movie that Nedry was working for that guy Dodson. Remember, hey, we got Dodson yes. here. Dodson was see, nobody cares. No, Dungeon Dodson was a competitor. Biosyn. Okay, so that's. I'm I'm just drawing on my deep Jurassic Park knowledge here to school you guys <laughs> a little bit, uh, but. So Ingen's not the only company that is interested in that, this technology. He was stealing the embryos for a rival company because they wanted to start yeah. their own Jurassic Park. So that was Biosyn. And again, I think like we that could be a way for them to go, which is like the 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 genie is out of the bottle. Pandora's box has kind of been opened in the that this like this cloning, this genetic manipulation technology. Um, and the idea that, like, hey, anybody can make a dinosaur or have a dinosaur um, isn't going to be propi proprietary to InGen anymore. Go ahead. Plus 25 years of, of, of right. cloning experience, what uh, what to do and what they can't. And yeah. P.D. Wong, you, you, like you said, he, he left with, uh, with all of his stuff. He, he took he his toys and went home for sure. Yeah. Um, this, he doesn't get to him. So I, I guess... No, I mean, are there like any other aspects of this plot that you that you want to kind of dissect or? Well, I would love to see a little bit more dealt with the philosophy behind the the reintroduction of dinosaurs into uh, modern evolution and how it would m mess up the the ecosystem specifically. The just trying to figure out where she fits on the food chain. Not, not just the food chain, but all aspects of it. I mean, we, uh, again, that was something that, that I love that, that they didn't go fully into with Jurassic Park, that they left that open for people to discuss after the movie. Because even, uh, ju even just outside of the food chain, you're also looking at uh, uh, the, the fact that they'll be using their own fair share of oxygen. Uh, they'll uh, have a, an effect on food sources, not just... Uh, human, uh, how that would be. Uh, yeah. would, th there's so much that they could do with this, and the, the, again, the problem is just how deep they're wanting to go into these philosophies and into these questions, uh, because again, this is legendary entertainment. They don't really do very deep type movies. Right, I mean, um, they're, they're, and actually I think their money is increasingly based on creature features, like they're, they're doing a King yeah, Kong remake. Monsters. They did Pacific Rim, Godzilla. So that seems to be where their their bread and butter is kind of going from now. So, but can we, can we go back to the whole oxygen thing for a second? Yeah. Because um, that's something that I'm definitely interested in seeing about because when dinosaurs were uh, were ruling the Earth, the ox oxygen content in the atmosphere was much higher than it yeah. is right now, prior yeah. to the, the the rise of the carbon that that we're seeing now. It was uh, significantly higher, and that's one of the reasons why they think they died died out is because mm -hmm. they were losing oxygen. And now we're reintroducing them, and how does that affect not only the food chain, but the climate yeah. and the atmosphere? Well, I mean, 
they a can, lot. They're probably yeah. the first clones that they made couldn't breathe, so that's where they had to put in like the cuttlefish DNA or or whatever it was that they they had to kind of like splice in there the frog DNA that let them spontaneously yeah. reproduce. Considering but, that, the, uh, that climate change now is a big deal, I think that this would be a a, a franchise that could actually deal with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the dinosaurs and then having that to be a part of that problem. Uh, so to me, I, again, the, the, there are so many opportunities and so many places they can go with it. The question is just how deep they're wanting to take this because they do have to worry about getting people into the seats. You're not going to get $200 million opening weekend by doing a, a whole thing on climate change. Like the inconvenient no. truth of dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> um, and can I, I ask, uh, as, as, since we're talking about cloning, which animal did they put into the DNA that allows them to get hit with an RPG and take no damage? Uh, I, I would say that's a Super Saiyan uh, that they cloned right there. I mean, because well, I mean, like, these go through cars, go through armored yeah. vehicles. <laughs> they, they take a licking, they keep on ticking, you know, they, they're Timex branded I'm dinosaurs. I was sitting there with my mouth open when that happened. I'm like, and, and like, I, I kind of had such a hard time with the movie, because as much as, like, the dinosaurs were eating people and stuff, when one of them got hurt, I was like, oh, no, the Velociraptor. Like, no, the poor thing. Like, yeah. I, they did I, a good job of getting you to side with certain dinosaurs. Yeah, uh, yeah it, absolutely. I mean, when the T-Rex comes out, and you know he's coming to oh. fight, at my time, she's, he was like, yeah, let's go. The T-Rex is a she. Right, yeah. Yeah, and when you realize that it is the original T Rex, yes. I didn't the realize film, that until your which, article. Right, I mean, you you might not catch it, but she's older. She's got the scars um, from fighting the Velociraptors in the first movie. Uh, it it literally, uh, they say she, you know she has been on the on the island for twenty five years, and and she gets the last line of the movie. Mm hmm. Yep. Yep, as, as, yeah, as it should be. <laughs> and that was the mistake of Jurassic Park 3. I'm sorry, killing off the T-Rex. Yeah. Big mistake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm also glad that that was on Isla Sarna and not Isla Nublar because that would have been the original T-Rex, yeah, and right. that that would have been infuriating. Uh, yeah. Although, you know, if, if this T-Rex had died going out fighting with mm -hmm. the Adonis Rex, I would have been okay right. with that because yeah, at least went down fight right. and, you know, something yeah. worthy of fighting. Yeah. I, I'm glad they didn't do the, oh, it's visions based on movement thing. Like, what if, like, <laughs> the Indominus just froze? It was like, oh, okay. Did anyone <laughs> notice that there wasn't as, as much blood in this one and, and that there were in the other movies? I mean, I think there, of only yeah. one scene where there was actual blood being sp spilled, or two of places where blood was being spilled. Even the most gruesome death in the film, you really don't see. Yeah. Because when she gets, when Zara gets dropped into the the Mosasaur's jaws, yeah. you don't see her get crunched. You see the Pteranodon get kind of yeah. like bit down on, but like it's above her. She was taking whole. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she, might, she, might, she might still be okay. We don't know. Yeah, she's a, yeah, kind of a Jonah. <laughs> allegory, but uh, you'll hear her cell phone go off. Um, but but yeah, like in Jurassic World, um, Richard Schiff gets like torn in half. Mm -hmm. yes. um, there there are some pretty gruesome dino deaths in these movies, and and with the exception of like, I, I have to enjoy like Vincent D'Onofrio literally like the hand the hand that feeds them kind of getting bit off mm -hmm. which maybe he'll come back with a cloned arm or something you don't know but scenery the entire time he's on screen you watch uh, he was so hungry he was chewing scenery yeah oh my god well he had nothing to do I mean I know we're talking about such a great actor and have him nothing to do yeah like, why even create this character he wasn't I mean, it was all for set for the next movie. I swear, this is all just so they could set up another movie. I hope so because I, to be perfectly honest, I still don't know who he worked for. I don't know where, why he was there. Right. I don't know what the heck he was doing. 
Um, he was just suddenly there and deciding he was using them I, for weapons. What? I do know, but again, it would take me so long to explain it because, again, there's so much backstory. They're setting up so much, and yet uh, on the second time around, I was piecing together all the little details that they were giving for each character. And i got to give it to Colin Trevorrow. He doesn't tell you everything. It's weird when he does tell you things like the kids talking about the divorce because so much of this movie is in hints and clues and, mm -hmm. and things that you look at and you have to look at this one place and there's something on this table or there's something on that map and it's all there that you have to piece together but it's like sometimes I feel like Universal is going, you know what, I don't understand this you know, put a scene in that explains it. Yeah. And that's yeah. how it feels at times because some, because like they hinted the divorce. They did a really good job at hinting yeah. the divorce. You didn't hear them saying that there was a divorce. Yeah. Oh, I, I googled it. I you know. And that entire story. scene feels like it was a reshoot. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So you want to talk about the money right quick? Because we are running a little bit I, out of time. I do want to talk about the money. I don't want to bore you guys to tears um, with the actual like statistics of how this movie performed, but, but the, the first thing that I'll say about the money is nobody expected this. I mean, no. people, they were anticipating that it would do well. Eric, you, you and I were having some discussions before the movie, and you were basically saying that this, this feels like a flop in the offing going, going forward, just in terms of, like, there was a, the, the, an embargo on reviews of the film, until late, uh, like Universal didn't. It felt like Universal didn't feel confident, confident in this movie. Yeah. Uh, again, it feels like uh, like uh, uh, Edge of Tomorrow, mm -hmm. where if it hadn't have done well, you you could almost blame Universal for the way that they uh, that they that they promoted this movie. They didn't really. They practically just put it on Chris Pratt's uh, yeah to go out and to, to do that. for it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we would see Vincent D'Onofrio, but he was still doing his Daredevil thing at the time, and and uh, uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, yeah, she would do things here and there, but it was like everyone was following Chris Pratt. It was all about Chris Pratt. Uh, they would do the behind the scenes with Chris Pratt. It was all focused on him, and it was like they were expecting him to do his Guardians of the Galaxy thing, yeah. and obviously it worked. Uh, but it's like when I look at how they advertise this thing, because the trailers were iffy. Uh, everyone that I would talk to when it comes to the trailers were either eh or I, I'm not feeling it. Yeah. Uh, again, it was one of those things like I was excited because it was a Jurassic Park movie, but if I were to tell you whether or not it would have done well, I would have said maybe modestly. Uh, I wouldn't have expected $200 million. Uh, well, I mean, half a billion worldwide, and the quick, the the fastest. Well, the first film to do 500 million worldwide in one weekend, the fastest to 500 million. Well, you gotta uh, give mean, it to China, but China they they released it in China on Wednesday. Yeah, they got they, they did get a little bit of a head start, and a lot of places showed it Thursday night. Yeah. Um, which is which is becoming a big thing. Uh, the premium format, like you mentioned, IMAX, 3D, Real D, XD, you know that that big seller in terms of tickets. And actually, um, if you look at the way that the movie performed, it was the top-grossing film of all time on Saturday and on Sunday. And that's usually when you see a drop-off. Like people will go for a, a movie that they're anticipating. They'll go Friday. They'll go Saturday. Sunday, you'll see these movies kind of drop off a bit. But I think word of mouth was so strong uh, with this film. And, I, and it, it certainly wasn't on the back of uh, critical reviews because, like, the reviews were so-so, like, I think 70% average on, like, Rotten Tomatoes. And it sure the wasn't the fanboys either. The fanboys were modestly contemptuous of the movie. They were upset that we didn't get this, we got that, we didn't want that. I mean, they were nitpicking the the hell out of this movie. Uh, so it wasn't that it was getting the rampant uh, base. The, the, right. the, the fanboys were not uh, too happy with this movie. So they were actually... I mean, I didn't see it till Sunday. This fanboy was pretty yeah. happy. But, yeah. I, yeah. I think the more, the more important um, number... Uh, more so than the Rotten Tomatoes is the Metacritic number, which uh, the audience uh, vote yeah. or well, I would go with the audience. 
both because um, it, it, if you in in a comparison and and this is strictly a numbers comparison because you can't compare the two movies. Um, over on Rotten Tomatoes, Mad Max Fury Road is ninety eight percent across the board. Yeah, okay, if you include them both, you go over to Metacritic, it's like eighty nine. Okay, and and, yeah. and the difference between the two for for those who may not be familiar is Rotten Tomatoes just just determines whether it's a positive or negative, um, whereas Metacritic they average the um, if if they're giving uh, numbers of stars how basically how it actually whether it's um, a, 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 a moderate positive or a good positive or a bad or uh, you know so it, that's kind of a, a better picture of what it's doing and it's not doing that well it's only like five fifty nine percent so it's kind of weird well I think what it is is that the, the for the most part the critics have been kind of it's me it's okay it's not no, it's not bad and you have to understand that it's critically speaking the movies that have been coming out this summer have mostly been met. I think yeah. that they were only happy about Spy and Mad Max. Right. Uh, everything else was was uh, very low on the radars. Um, and and I think in terms of like there's a there's an article that um, Entertainment Weekly in their Ask the Critic column posted, which is kind of like how you how you judge. A film in kind of like your critical review and and the yeah, way that how the sausage is made type yeah it yeah. and it and it and it is but um you know a, a director like Colin Trevorrow who did a, a fairly well received indie film as his really his his only prior experience by the way safety not guaranteed you can check out on Art House Legends episode fifteen go all the way back uh, to episode fifteen we covered that a couple of years ago yeah. um and so, but again, like, so you look at that and you look at kind of the pedigree of, like, Steven Spielberg is an executive producer. You, you would expect a film of a certain quality. I feel that it delivered it. I, I agree with the reviewers that looked favorably on the film, with the exception, I think, as I mentioned, of sort of the characterization um, development in yeah. the film being, being one of the weak points, but not to the point that it, that it truly hinders the film. Uh, mostly, they you know the characters kind of get out of the way, and uh, it's pretty good. But but it, but again, like, oh, go ahead. No, I was well, just gonna say my my biggest problem with the characters is, is not just Claire. Um, I think Chris Pratt does does well because Chris Pratt is charming and is good at his job. But that character is pretty one dimensional. Yeah, and and they never truly explain when he was in the navy how yeah. he learned to train well, the lesser raptors. <laughs> Isn't that what he said? They said that yeah, you know, he yeah, you're right, you you're right, but right he, out of the navy. Was he training? I think maybe he was he training dolphins. dolphins. He was he was in the Darwin program. You know, yeah. Um, is, is he a, is, does he have a doctorate? What uh, what is he? Uh, yeah, that's trophy himself. Um, I, I got the I got the feeling when I came out of the movie well, that. Joss Whedon's tweet about the scene that was mm -hmm. released was spot on as far as characters go. And even uh, it, 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 Colin was kind of yeah I, yeah I kind of I kind of agree yeah. but and it, but at the same time he he's also he was also saying you really should see it because there's there's more to it than that and yeah. and I did get the some. Some of the stuff that I was reading was saying that you know you can't tell if they're if they're embracing the tropes because they think they're being clever or if they're embracing the tropes because that's what they did, and like I said, the, all of them are tropes. Well, that's it's the like thing. They went and scooped them all up and bundled up a character and said, "Here you go." Well, that's the thing, though, is that. Uh all the characters are, are kind of tropish. And this is kind of like a live-action version of the Pixar effect where the the non-real things are more real than the real things. Um, you know, the, the human characters uh, were more kind of like placemats. And out of those, like, like we were mentioning, Claire had more character uh, than most of the other characters combined, most of which were, were male. Um... 
I, I will say though that uh, we didn't mention Jake Johnson right quick. <laughs> I I I kind of liked what he did, although I have a feeling that a bunch of his stuff hit the uh, hit, hit the uh, cutting room floor. So I'm, I'm curious to see what the latest scenes. Uh, there's going to be uh, with this uh, DVD Blu-ray, which I will be purchasing. I mean, when you when you talk about the person in the film who is the uh, the avatar for the audience, um, he was kind of my avatar. I felt like with his uh, he was supposed to be the avatar for the fanboy though. T-shirt and well, yeah, exactly, and his um, his dinosaurs on his, uh, which I love the chaotic. You know, oh, your your workstation is chaotic. It looks chaotic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the like, oh, it's a, a finely tuned ecosystem or something like that. But um, but yeah, I mean, so there there is a fair amount of controversy. We kind of mentioned it earlier that the film has that the film has generated um, with respect to, I guess, you know, C- Claire's character, the relationship between her character and Chris Pratt. Um, character uh, or Bryce Dallas Howard's character and Chris Pratt's character, and and again, I, to me, I really feel like this is something where you can kind of like put your agenda on it and say, oh, it's anti-feminist, oh, it's you know pro-feminist, it's this, it's that, and a lot of the articles that I've been reading like kind of go either way on it, and I'm just kind of curious, is this something that you've put any thought into or Kind of just take with a grain of salt. I should have just say that Judy Greer would have body slammed Bryce Dallas Howard uh, that last scene uh, for leaving <laughs> her kids alone. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, and especially considering that this is the voice of Cheryl. I was kind of expecting it, you know. Just saying. But uh, or do we have any Archer fans in? <laughs> right. Okay. Right. I mean. Uh, part of me was like, there's the backstory between the two of them. Like, well, you know, if you, you know, when you have kids, if I have kids, like, shut up. Like, what business of it of yours? Like, you have kids and your, you know, your marriage is falling apart here and this and that. Like, your life's how much better than mine, right? Like, mm-hmm. you can't even take the vacation with your kids that you're, you know, sending them on. That's true. Uh, I know that we're kind of getting a little yeah. late here. Yeah. Uh, Jeannie, can you hear us? Or are you still... Are you with us? Yeah, we lost her for a sec. Uh, well, uh, out of curiosity, would you recommend this movie to other people? Or if you uh, have conditions, what kind of people would you recommend this movie to? Would, would I recommend this movie? Yes. I would recommend this movie to pretty much anybody that I know. Um, I think that the... the the, the Jurassic World train is probably going to keep rolling. And I, I'm kind of more curious to see what effect this is going to have on certainly the industry predictions for the Star Wars film coming out in December. This kind of a, a game that we've been playing on the Gunna Geek Network of like, like how high is it going to go? And certainly the same factors of you know a heavy nostalgic quotient a heavy sort of like geek quotient like going into it is i i mean i'm just anticipating that uh the the jurassic world effect is going to hit star wars as well uh, out of curiosity, uh, Jeannie, would you recommend this movie to others? And if you do, are there specific people that you would recommend it to? Um, I would. Uh, if you if you if you want to see dinosaurs fighting, I would definitely recommend it. And there are some people I would definitely recommend it to because I know that they would like it. Um, it would be a cautious recommendation because there uh, are like. Because there are, when, when I, basically when I left the movie, like I said, I, I did have fun, but I was basically um, wishing, wishing that at the end. Uh, Jeannie? Yeah. Sorry, we're, we're getting you a couple. All right. We've getting... successfully cloned Jeannie, I can... <laughs> I saw her twice there for a second. <laughs> We're getting there. Yes. It's 
Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no. My... I was I was just saying that like the cloning process worked because we saw two of you there for a second. <laughs> yeah, because I was I jumped on my phone because my internet dumped, uh -huh. <laughs> and it came back in the middle of me talking. <laughs> But um, uh, what I was saying is, is, yeah, there are some people I would recommend it to, some people I wouldn't. I did have fun, and, uh, but when I walked out of the theater, when I really thought about it, I, had, uh, I was kind of wishing that I had watched Mad Max instead. <laughs> and okay. th like, one of the things that I think is so interesting is when you look at, like, obviously the film's only, you know, it's been out less than a week, but the audience demographics so far are 52% male and 48% female. So that I mean that's a pretty good split for this kind of a film that, you know, obviously the 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 argument of like that you know women don't get, go see movies like this or or vice versa. Um I mean that's that's a a pretty good split for what Eric was kind of describing as a fanboy movie. Yeah, I would I would also say that that uh, assumption um is all too prevalent in in um the Hollywood studios, right. and in my experience, uh, it's simply not true. Right, and I'm and I'm also kind of curious too because um, when you dropped a little bit, we were we we kind of revisited the uh, the kind of like the sexism discussion mm -hmm. with this film, and and of those, you know, forty eight percent female audience, like I, I'm just wondering what what the reaction is to to Claire's character and. Uh, her relationship with Chris, you know, with uh, Owen in the film, and 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 that kind of kind of well, think of because I, again, I I feel like this is something where you can kind of you put your perspective on it and yeah, um, my my frustration with her is they could have done so much more for her uh, as far as character development, right? Um, it you know. As I alluded to uh, uh, earlier, I don't get the push why she has to be this way. Um, and, and I have to tell you for the record, if my sister corrected me and told me when I have kids, if I'm talking to her about if I have kids, we would have our very first fist fight as adults. <laughs> that conversation never happens between that that correction never happens with sisters that's that's a mother thing never sisters <laughs> but well it depends um, on the relationship between the sisters so if there is some more of a uh, you know if, if they've had an absentee mother or uh, one had taken over that role I could see that particularly happening and it does feel like these two have been to, uh, on their own it, that um, mother thing was kind of implied too that the mother had had left the picture was, fairly early. But again, the, that's another subplot. Yeah, that that's, that's really a subplot. Well, 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 when they when they introduce Claire, and uh, her introduction is she's supposed to be taking care of the kids, and we're immediately put in a situation where we're not going to like her. You have your main protagonist for the movie. And you've introduced her so that the people don't like her mm -hmm. because she dumps them on her assistant. I mean, I, I feel like probably Judy Greer dumped them on her and was like, yeah. Yeah. you need you need to take the kids for the weekend. You, you know, they've yeah. just, just go, but, you know. But, but at the same time, the way that it's, and, and I agree, yeah. but the way that it's pre presented is, you know, they're gonna, you're going to go see your aunt, and you're going to spend time with your aunt, and she doesn't have time. Um, they could have they solved that yeah. uh, in any number of ways in, in showing that Judy Greer is dumping them on her, and she's too busy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I also think they should have, uh, I would have, preferred if they had made it so the reason that she's pushing herself is not just because she's career minded and and I, I, I resent the, the, the presentation that she has to choose between motherhood and, right. and career. Um, Maybe when, I, I mean, like, if you live on an island with dinosaurs, I think yeah. it's fair to, to say maybe that's not a place to raise children. Like, exactly. Fair. Exactly. That's a really fair point. Like, 
you know, if I could maybe work in Orlando, having yeah. kids would be an option for me. But right. uh, well, you wouldn't have to worry about the Pirates of the Caribbean eating, you, you know, the, uh, right. the eating tourists. The, eating the tourists. But if, if they had presented the corporate pressure that they're implying more overtly yeah. to show that she can't spend time with them because her job is on the line. I mean, they kind of hint at that, but yeah. it's kind of it's so subtle it's almost missed unless you're looking for it. Yeah, actually, it was not very subtle. <laughs> it was but, but, but I don't I don't really fully get that her job is on the line until yeah. dinosaurs start escaping. The, um, the another thing, and again this is kinda like the the movie's perspective that and here's one thing that irked me, is like she's under all this like pressure and stuff, but but uh Chris Pratt gets to hang out at his cabana on yeah. the beach and tinker with his motorcycle right. and stuff, and like he he's living the uh, the Margaritaville lifestyle yeah. out there, yeah. and and you know, they they essentially present her as the stiff, uptight woman, complete with bitch haircut. Okay, she has the haircut was the the, the soccer mom haircut was j that that says that screams, "I want to speak to your manager." That's the haircut she, they give her. They they present her as this stiff uh, woman who just needs a man to loosen her up. And yeah. is this is a good just time? Guy to do it. Is this a good time to say that I actually uh, dated someone seriously that was in this kind of managerial position, and they do have, or that there's a compulsion to uh, act and dress this way um, from. Yeah. Personal experience. I'm, I'm just saying that uh, that's something uh, I, that I've actually seen with my own eyes. Did she eyes. give you a yes. itinerary for your first date? Happen. What I'm saying is the way that they're presenting her is that she's a bitch on wheels, and she just needs a man to loosen her up. And like yes. to me, and, like it's. I mean, at least two nephews to loosen her up. I don't think it has to be a man. I think that she does. That she definitely does have this. This. Uh, Feel like she is very uptight. I don't think it has anything to do with uh, uh, with uh, sexuality specifically. I just think that it's just her nature, and especially the way that she's dealing with her nephews, definitely also give that impression that she is uh, really on tight. That and and I got the sense from her character that she like beats herself up, like she. She yeah. has like maybe a, a bit of a because you see her in in that first thing where she's going over the the lines in the elevator, and and then she kind of like is kicking herself for being three minutes late, and this is she's always kind of like down on herself about. This is a woman who would use her heels as her shield. Yeah, and and I think that That's characterization lovely. fits. Yeah, but, but I again I I liked her character. Um, was you know and and again I, I like Bryce Dallas Howard I'm a, maybe a right, little biased but you know here's the, here's the thing though I have nothing to relate to her um, because they yeah. they the way that they presented her in the first place in the in the in the second place and I'm not saying sh that she needs a man sexually to loosen her up Chris Pratt's character is Lucy Goosey and he's like oh you just gotta you got you just gotta chill out and then but and then he's she, also the voice of reason in the film too. Funny. She's being punished for the first half of the movie because she's not maternal. And by the end of the movie, she's smiling and blushing prettily because her boyfriend's a badass and she uh, and she puts her nephews in front of her job. That's a problem. I I could I definitely understand where you're coming from on that and and I'm not uh and I think that you actually are onto something specifically uh in, in that particular thing, especially if you look at it from a punishment reward uh, scenario, when it comes to the the way that the story goes, um, I am curious. I'm more curious about these uh, that these characters, and I think that it's one of those situations where the characters are actually rich. It's just that the story, right. in a way, just doesn't meet the uh, the level that the characters are. At. I feel like th that perhaps there was something more richer. It more than likely is on the cutting room table. Uh, I got the feeling that th this really does feel like they cut a lot out of the film that dealt with those personal relationships, mm -hmm. especially since we know that Colin Trevorrow, uh, where he comes from, the fact that he wrote uh, a, or rewrote a lot of this script, I get the feeling that he added those things to the film. It's just that uh, 
especially in the legendary pictures kind of thing, more monsters, less talking. Right. Uh, and then more that teeth. kind of yeah, more teeth, uh, cooler, <laughs> you know. And I'm and I'm hoping that the line at at the end where they say you know well we should stick together for survival. I'm I'm hoping that they both come back. I know that Chris Pratt is attached for the sequel at this point, but I I think it really needs the two of them um, to 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 come back and. Uh, maybe they start their own consulting f- firm with like, let us help handle your dinosaur issues or or something like yeah. that. Like maybe there's like a Ghostbusters type spinoff where uh, Velociraptor in your shower. <laughs> Who are you gonna call? You know what I mean? Like, it could be. I you know if you if you write it correct uh, if you write it um, well um, and you flesh out those characters more than with than is currently yeah. on screen. That could be that could be a relationship, a working relationship. It doesn't right. have to be a sexual relationship. A working relationship between the two of them could work um, on screen. And I think it would, and 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 the f- they they do have different philosophies, but they work together. Yeah. But even when you have a partnership like that, where um, you and, have competing philosophies, but they but they want the same goal, there is enough friction there to bring a good dramatic story. And an, and another issue with Claire's character that is kind of presented is like she doesn't really see the dinosaurs as living creatures. She sees mm-hmm. them as assets, and that's something that gets addressed. And and that yeah. scene with the dying Apatosaurus was very touching to me. And I you know that the scene and she, she's crying and the dinosaur the dinosaur is dying and it's it's really kind of touching. I'm glad that the that the movie took took the time to have that moment. Yeah, but I think um, that that's kind of going back towards what Jeannie was trying to say, especially when it comes to the dinosaurs being assets. If you think about it, in a way, she also treats her nephews as assets. Uh, well, no, because I don't think she's leveraging them. There's no, like, she's not levering, leveraging them against her sister. No, like, really. Get... But what she is doing specifically is, is that she's measuring how much time of her attention that she needs to give them as compared to... Uh, her other responsibilities, um, and then that element, the calculation, is the the key here. Not so much uh, the the end result or what her intents are, because I think she wants to be a good aunt. The problem here is that she's unsure about how to be a good aunt, and that she uh, feels that if she spent too much time, it would affect her job. And it's clear which one is more important to her at this particular point. Well, and it's also again. I mean, and again, we can talk about this for hours. I feel like, yes. but uh, we need um, to wrap can, it up. <laughs> do you? How would you compare her arc, I guess, to Alan Grant in the first movie, which is again a character who really does not want to have much to do with children, and yet by the end of the film, like develops a relationship with children. Alan and likes Grant. Them, Alan Grant's them. arc was much better done. Yeah. But is there like without the gendered implication of motherhood? No, it's it's much better done in Jurassic Park. Yeah, it, the thing is, is that well, with with Grant specifically, the thing is, is that it was the that um, it was implied that if you spent more time around kids, that it would loosen them up. And then, as we find out, yes, it, it that, that he would loosen up. But at the same time, as we find out in Jurassic Park three, not enough to have kids. But he does have a deeper respect for them. He doesn't humiliate them That's like he did that only one kid. Doctor Sattler, and she married someone else. We're, 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 we're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. Let's, let's write some fanfic about it. And, uh... but there, 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 was a, there was a level of judgment in Jurassic World yeah. on her character in the fact that she can't relate to them that isn't there with Grant. Well, I think the movie judges Grant, too, uh, especially considered because the first thing he does in the movie is he humiliates a small child. He I mean, he doesn't. The, he slams the door in in Tim Murphy's face there. But that. But again, that scene is played for laughs. Yeah. And that's kind of like the the contrast here. Yeah. Although I think it is. I think there is a humor in it, um, a little bit, which is the fact that yes, okay, like her nephews are are here to visit her and stuff. But this is also like the wor- literally the worst day of work ever for her, mm-hmm. and and it's kind of like. She she is is also weighing the time that she gets to spend with her children versus 
everyone who is, you know, that she's ostensibly responsible for in this in this park. Yeah. And yeah. and their lives and their jobs and, and livelihood and everything like and, that. And and I think that she if it was me and my sister in that situation, okay, and my sister's trying to chastise me because I'm not spending enough time with her kids that she sent to me. That's exactly what I would tell her. Say, look, I'm really sorry, but this is literally the worst day you could have sent them to me. You know, and yeah. and that would garner more sympathy from an audience yeah. perspective. Where it, in fact, it, but instead, she just takes it. Yeah. Well, that's why I think there was a third phone call uh, that was cut out of the film because uh, the second phone call when Judy Greer is calling. Uh, for you know to to find you know, because she found out about her kids being with the assistant, uh, yeah, there was that tension, there was that anger, there was that frustration. Uh, I think that that uh, there there was a third phone call where there was understanding where she was, uh, where, where she does kind of let it out. That would have been a great moment for the character to let it out. That we see right. her build up intent and then to yes. let it out on her sister, who's terrified because she's hearing about what's going on. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that this is what the scene is. But to me, especially considering that the next time we see these two characters together, there's catharsis where, as I was said, if it were me, if, if that, the last words were the ones that were said on the phone at that phone call, I would have body checked her uh, for, leaving, you know, for not paying attention to where my kids were and yeah. that that this happened to them, especially if I hear about the whole gyrosphere, you know, going off road. So, hey, yeah, they I'll, they went through that well, fence. They shouldn't have gone through that fence. They and, knew better. And and they should have presented her assistant as much more competent than they did. Oh. Because I'm not do that one. At all. If it's me, I can't, I can't. if it's me, and it's my sister's kids, and it's literally the worst day I could be watching my sister's kids, I'm not just going to dump them on an incompetent assistant. Okay, I'm going to have was... someone who can, who it's not necessarily good with the kids. She doesn't have to be good with the kids, but yeah. she has to be presented as competent because otherwise, she's it doesn't make any sense for her to send them with her. Well, I think that they did that so that they could have, so that people don't feel bad when she gets chomped on. Uh, that I think, would, I think that that's one of the reasons why they did that, and I'm not, and I'm not forgiving them for it. I'm just saying that that's probably why they allowed her to be so heartless and careless. Although, uh, and we really do have to wrap this up. <laughs> We're running it's, really it's late. It's unfortunate yet. that um, Zara was presented almost as a mini Claire. I, I think that there could have been a little bit more of an well, no, interesting, she was getting interesting dynamic. There or I mean, like, it, I don't, I don't want Lauren Lapkus's character to have gotten eaten by the Mosasaur, but I think that would have been a more interesting arc for her character, and again, a, a better use of a great actress that that yeah. they give us in this movie, who doesn't really get enough to do. Um, well, she did have one of the great jokes in the movie. Yeah, I mean, no, no, it wasn't that funny. It really wasn't. Oh come on, but, that was a trick that they that they body slammed on that one. That was. The, no. the, the fact that they went completely against uh, the stereotype, that was awesome. No, no, it I wasn't. Didn't, I didn't know you were that serious. <laughs> All right, well, but we really didn't have to wrap this up. Okay, so we wrap it up by talking about what the zookeepers are doing. Oh, I love that. Yes. With the animals, because that's awesome. And I well, think it's a good thing place to end on. Yeah, yes, the, uh, the, the one with it. the walruses is probably my favorite. The walruses. Oh, is I haven't the seen that one. <laughs> I don't know walruses, seals, the tigers, and the but lions. Again, like um, I, I, I kind of ribbed on the movie earlier about not being as like quotable and stuff, but I think it'll it'll hold up pretty well. Um, I'm I'm hoping at least till we get to the next one. Um, yeah. It'll it'll definitely hold me over. It's, it's a good movie. I, I liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. It's a monster movie. It doesn't really try to be more than that. Uh, yeah. I think that that's one of the things that, that this does over the other ones, where they thought that they could try to equal Jurassic Park yeah. here. They're not even trying. They're saying, okay, we, we're not going to go that far. We're going to just give ourselves some good monsters, some passable characters, and so let, let them fight. Yeah. Uh, do what Godzilla refused to do last year. I think that's uh, kind of the the uh, what they were telling themselves as they were editing this film. But uh, 
that's all I really have to say about it. That's it. But, uh, Jeannie, do you have anything you want to plug, anything you want to say about uh, any of your upcoming shows? Well, um, Tyrion's Landing, we just uh, we just talked about the season finale of Game of Thrones, so uh, check that out. Uh, we're at Tyrion's Landing on Twitter and uh, Tyrion'sLanding.com. Uh, I also have a movie podcast called More Than Chick Flicks, where we're all catching up on movies that we missed. Um, and uh, the most recent episode, we... Uh, we discussed Friday uh, with Ice Cube. Yes. And uh, this weekend, uh, we'll be releasing our movie, uh, Pulp Fiction. Awesome. Of course, we also have a Pulp Fiction episode in the Art House Legends archives found on iTunes and the Gonna Geek website. Right. But what about you? Oh, sorry. More than Chick Flicks. You can find More Than Chick Flicks at, on iTunes and uh, at morethanchickflicks.com. What about you, Lobster? Anything you want to plug? Uh, well, um, I'm on a podcast called Art House Legends with Eric. <laughs> uh, and I think the next one that we're going to do is actually pretty timely because we're going to talk about Shawshank Redemption. And oh, we can do that too. In the news, oh my gosh, in the news <laughs> right now, there's like this crazy thing where these guys escaped from a prison and Stephen King was like, hey, it's funny how... You know, but anyway, yeah. um, and I'm also on a podcast called Crimson Comet. We talk about the Flash, and this summer we're rewatching the 1990 Flash series. Oh so my that's God. that's fun. Um, that's so you can check e either one of those out, and hopefully I'll be back on one of these vidcasts to talk about something else in the near future. Well, we definitely have a whole lot of stuff coming up on the vidcast. Uh, hopefully next week we'll be talking about Inside Out, another film that I'm deeply excited about talking about. Also, make sure to check out the top 100 list of the best, mo uh, the greatest movies of all time with yours truly. Uh, also, make sure to uh, hit that subscribe, subscribe button down here. Subscribe, subscribe, yes, subscribe. Yes, hit that subscribe that. button. Okay. Uh, also, if you don't mind, hit that little like button too while you're at it. Okay. You know, sh show, us, uh, show us a little love. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in hearing the, the podcast with the greatest host of all time, uh, yours truly, obviously, uh, maybe that other guy over there, but uh, you can find that at uh, on iTunes. It's Art House Legends, also on the Gunna Geek website, uh, gunnageek.com, as well as arthouselegends.com. So, so now this, that we've had this whole big self-congratulatory bet, um, Let's let's take it out and name your favorite dinosaur. I I've got to say that uh, my favorite is that whale shark thing that I can't remember the name of. I love it. I, Mosasaurus. It works for me. I I just love the fact that every time it comes out, it does something awesome. Genie. I got to go with blue. <laughs> the Velociraptor. She's awesome. Um, I actually really like the Dilophosaurus, and I was glad that we got two Dilophosaurus jokes, one with Jimmy Fallon, and the, oh, is this real? And then he falls over, and then, of course, the hologram Dilophosaurus that pops up. If you're not going to have a real one in, that was pretty yeah. good. I love the fact that it actually works. That yeah. was awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, that was good. So, that's it. So, uh, at, this, uh, at this time, this is the movie Dude Eric. This is John Lobster. And I'm Jeannie. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>